Chapter 5 of The Game of Life and How to Play It. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin. Chapter 5 The Law of Karma and the Law of Forgiveness. Man receives only that which he gives. The game of life is a game of boomerangs. Man's thoughts, deeds, and words return to him sooner or later, with astounding accuracy. This is the law of karma, which is Sanskrit for comeback. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For example, a friend told me this story of herself, illustrating the law. She said, I make all my karma on my aunt. Whatever I say to her, someone says to me. I am often irritable at home when one day said to my aunt, who was talking to me during dinner, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. The following day I was lunching with a woman with whom I wished to make a great impression. I was talking animatedly when she said, No more talk. I wish to eat in peace. My friend is high in consciousness, so her karma returns much more quickly than to one on the mental plane. The more man knows, the more he is responsible for, and a person with a knowledge of spiritual law, which he does not practice, suffers greatly in consequence. The fear of the Lord, law, is the beginning of wisdom. If we read the word Lord, law, It will make many passages in the Bible much clearer. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord, law. It is the law which takes vengeance, not God. God sees man perfect, created in his own image, imagination, and given power and dominion. This is the perfect idea of man, registered in divine mind, awaiting man's recognition, For man can only be what he sees himself to be, and only attain what he sees himself attaining. Nothing ever happens without an onlooker, is an ancient saying. Man first sees his failure or success, his joy or sorrow, before it swings into visibility from the scenes set in his own imagination. We have observed this in the mother picturing disease for her child or a woman seeing success for her husband. Jesus Christ said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we see freedom from all unhappy conditions comes through knowledge, a knowledge of spiritual law. Obedience precedes authority, and the law obeys man when he obeys the law. The law of electricity must be obeyed before it becomes man's servant. When handled ignorantly, it becomes man's deadly foe. So with the laws of mind. For example, a woman with a strong personal will wished she owned a house which belonged to an acquaintance, and she often made mental pictures of herself living in the house. In the course of time, the man died, and she moved into the house. Several years afterwards, coming into the knowledge of spiritual law, she said to me, Do you think I had anything to do with that man's death? I replied, Yes, your desire was so strong, everything made way for it. But you paid your karmic debt. Your husband, whom you loved devotedly, died soon after, and the house was a white elephant on your hands for many years. The original owner, however, could not have been affected by her thoughts, had he been positive in the truth, nor her husband, but they were both under karmic law. The woman should have said, feeling the great desire for the house, Infinite intelligence, give me the right house, equally as charming as this, the house which is mine by divine right. The divine selection would have given perfect satisfaction and brought good to all. The divine pattern is the only safe pattern to work by. Desire is a tremendous force and must be directed in the right channels or chaos ensues. In demonstrating, the most important step is the first step to ask aright. 
Man should always demand only that which is his by divine right. To go back to the illustration, had the woman taken this attitude, if this house, I desire, is mine, I cannot lose it. If it is not, give me its equivalent. The man might have decided to move out harmoniously had it been the divine selection for her, or another house would have been substituted. Anything forced into manifestation through personal will is always ill-got and has ever bad success. Man is admonished, My will be done, not thine. And the curious thing is, man always gets just what he desires when he does relinquish all personal will, thereby enabling infinite intelligence to work through him. Stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord, law. For example, a woman came to me in great distress. Her daughter had determined to take a very hazardous trip, and the mother was filled with fear. She said she had used every argument, had pointed out the dangers to be encountered, had forbidden her to go, but the daughter became more and more rebellious and determined. I said to the mother, You are forcing your personal will upon your daughter, which you have no right to do, and your fear of the trip is only attracting it, for man attracts what he fears. I added, Let go and take your mental hands off. Put it in God's hands and use this statement. I put this situation in the hands of infinite love and wisdom. If this trip is the divine plan, I bless it and no longer resist. But if it is not divinely planned, I give thanks that it is now dissolved and dissipated. A day or two after that, her daughter said to her, Mother, I have given up the trip. And the situation returned to its native nothingness. It is learning to stand still, which seems so difficult for man. I will deal more fully with this law in the chapter on non-resistance. I will give another example of sowing and reaping, which came in the most curious way. A woman came to me saying she had received a counterfeit $20 bill given to her at the bank. She was much disturbed, for, she said, the people at the bank will never acknowledge their mistake. I replied, Let us analyze the situation and find out why you attracted it. She thought a few moments and exclaimed, I know it. I sent a friend a lot of stage money just for a joke. So the law had sent her some stage money, for it doesn't know anything about jokes. I said, now we will call on the law of forgiveness and neutralize the situation. Christianity is founded upon the law of forgiveness. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the karmic law, and the Christ within each man is his redeemer and salvation from all inharmonious conditions. So I said, Infinite Spirit, we call on the law of forgiveness and give thanks that she is under grace and not under law, and cannot lose this twenty dollars, which is hers, by divine right. Now, I said, go back to the bank and tell them, fearlessly, that it was given you there by mistake. She obeyed, and, to her surprise, they apologized and gave her another bill, treating her most courteously. So knowledge of the law gives man power to rub out his mistakes, Man cannot force the external to be what he is not. If he desires riches, he must be rich first in consciousness. For example, a woman came to me asking treatment for prosperity. She did not take much interest in her household affairs, and her home was in great disorder. I said to her, If you wish to be rich, you must be orderly. All men with great wealth are orderly and order is heaven's first law. I added, you will never become rich with a burnt match in the pincushion. She had a good sense of humor and commenced immediately putting her house in order. She rearranged furniture, straightened out her bureau drawers, cleaned rugs, and soon made a big financial demonstration, a gift from a relative. 
The woman herself became made over and keeps herself keyed up financially by being ever watchful of the external and expecting prosperity, knowing God is her supply. Many people are in ignorance of the fact that gifts and things are investments and that hoarding and saving invariably lead to loss. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. For example, I knew a man who wanted to buy a fur-lined overcoat. He and his wife went to various shops, but there was none he wanted. He said they were all too cheap-looking. At last he was shown one, the salesman said was valued at a thousand dollars, but which the manager would sell him for five hundred dollars, as it was late in the season. His financial possessions amounted to about seven hundred dollars. The reasoning mind would have said, you can't afford to spend nearly all you have on a coat. But he was very intuitive and never reasoned. He turned to his wife and said, if I get this coat, I'll make a ton of money. So his wife consented, weakly. About a month later, he received a $10,000 commission. The coat made him feel so rich, it linked him with success and prosperity. Without the coat, he would not have received the commission. It was an investment paying large dividends. If man ignores these leadings to spend or to give, the same amount of money will go in an uninteresting or unhappy way. For example, a woman told me on Thanksgiving Day she informed her family that they could not afford a Thanksgiving dinner. She had the money, but decided to save it. A few days later, someone entered her room and took from the bureau drawer the exact amount the dinner would have cost. The law always stands back of the man who spends fearlessly with wisdom. For example, one of my students was shopping with her little nephew. The child clamored for a toy, which she told him she could not afford to buy. She realized suddenly that she was seeking lack and not recognizing God as her supply. So she bought the toy and on her way home, picked up in the street the exact amount of money she had paid for it. Man's supply is inexhaustible and unfailing when fully trusted, but faith or trust must precede the demonstration. According to your faith, be it unto you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For faith holds the vision steady, and the adverse pictures are dissolved and dissipated, and in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Jesus Christ brought the good news, the gospel, that there was a higher law than the law of karma, and that that law transcends the law of karma. It is the law of grace or forgiveness. It is the law which frees man from the law of cause and effect, the law of consequence. Under grace, not under law. We are told that on this plane, man reaps where he has not sown. The gifts of God are simply poured out upon him. All that the kingdom affords is his. This continued state of bliss awaits the man who has overcome the race or world thought. In the world thought, there is tribulation. But as Jesus Christ said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The world thought is that of sin, sickness, and death. He saw their absolute unreality and said sickness and sorrow shall pass away and death itself, the last enemy, be overcome. We now know from a scientific standpoint that death could be overcome by stamping the subconscious mind with the conviction of eternal youth and eternal life. The subconscious, being simply power without direction, carries out orders without questioning. Working under the direction of the superconscious, the Christ or God within man, the resurrection of the body would be accomplished. 
man would no longer throw off his body in death. It would be transformed into the body electric, sung by Walt Whitman, for Christianity is founded upon the forgiveness of sins and an empty tomb. End of chapter 5. Recording by Amy Conger. In Chapter 5 of The Game of Life and How to Play It, Florence Scovel Shin delves into the profound concepts of the law of karma and the law of forgiveness, infusing them with the guiding light of Christian wisdom. This chapter serves as a radiant reminder of the transformative power of these principles in shaping our lives for the better. Shin begins by exploring the law of karma, often summarized as, as you sow, so shall you reap. Drawing parallels with biblical teachings, she reminds us that the energy we release into the world through our actions and thoughts returns to us in kind. With deep conviction, she emphasizes the importance of conscious choices aligned with love, kindness, and righteousness. This law, rooted in Christian ethics, is an invitation to lead a life of purposeful intent, understanding that our actions echo throughout time. Incorporating the Christian virtue of forgiveness, Shin then introduces the law of forgiveness. Drawing from the teachings of Christ, she underscores the liberation found in forgiving others and ourselves. Shin's words radiate with the understanding that forgiveness is not only a balm for wounded hearts but also a powerful tool for breaking karmic chains. She invites us to release resentment and bitterness, allowing divine grace to flow through us. Here are key takeaways from this chapter. 1. Law of Karma Our actions and thoughts hold profound significance. By sowing seeds of love, compassion, and positivity, we pave the way for a future rich with blessings. 2. Divine Justice The concept of karma aligns with biblical principles, reflecting the timeless truth that our deeds have consequences. 3. Conscious Choices Choose actions rooted in integrity and kindness, understanding that they create a ripple effect throughout time. 4. Law of Forgiveness Forgiveness is a divine gift, not just to others but to ourselves. It breaks karmic cycles and allows us to embrace our true potential. 5. Healing Power by forgiving, we unlock inner healing, inviting divine grace to transform our lives. 6. Liberation Through Love Jesus' teachings on forgiveness underscore the path to spiritual liberation and growth. 7. Release and Renewal Forgiveness offers a fresh start, freeing us from the burden of negativity and resentment. In this chapter, Shin weaves Christian principles into the fabric of karma and forgiveness, illuminating the intertwining nature of spirituality and personal growth. Through her insights, we are reminded that our choices and forgiveness hold the keys to our own transformation and destiny. This chapter resonates as a beacon of hope, inviting us to walk the path of conscious choices and boundless forgiveness, ultimately leading us to a life imbued with divine purpose and grace. As we conclude our exploration of the transformative concepts in Chapter 5 of The Game of Life and How to Play It, we invite you to continue this journey of enlightenment and empowerment with us. By subscribing to our channel, you'll stay connected to a tapestry of wisdom woven from Christian teachings and universal truths. Dive deeper into the profound principles of karma, forgiveness, and the power of conscious choices. Let each video be a guiding light on your path to spiritual growth and personal development. Together, let's embark on a voyage of inspiration, upliftment, and encouragement. Don't miss out on any of the transformative insights that await you. Hit that subscribe button, join our vibrant community, and let's navigate this journey of life's profound mysteries and empowering revelations together. Subscribe now and be part of a movement that seeks to embrace the fullness of life, guided by faith, wisdom, and purpose. 
Thank you for being with us on this incredible journey of discovery and transformation.